<laughs> so, um, I've decided to do a little bit more on this. Um, okay. um, who am I? How many people know who I am? Hands up. Yeah. Right, so we'll do a very, very quick introduction to who I am. Okay. I am one of these. I'm not one of them. I'm not one of them. I used to be one of these until these guys decided they couldn't solve real crimes and locked me up for CNA. Um, that was a bit of a bummer, but it had some advantages in the fact that I became quite famous. Um, to the point where these guys, these guys, and these guys gave me a job. <laughs> I don't always look like this when I'm working. Obviously, it's a bit warm, so sometimes I look like that. Um, anyway, when I'm not doing this, I like to do this. I also like to do this, and I love doing this. Which is really handy when these people can do that. <laughs> in about 30 seconds. However, who's the reason why that's something best I don't know. <laughs> right, so on with the main talk. Can everyone hear me first of all? Yeah. <laughs> right, so there's some ground rules. Uh, we're running a bit short on time now, so keep all the questions for after the talk. Um, or after lunch. I'm going to down. Right, so a brief history. You can probably read this next time. Right, basically, a bunch of people throughout history of always faked images. So, these ones, two little girls called Sir Arthur and Doyle, a little bit of slack. Uh, <laughs> Stalin didn't like people, so he had them taken out photos. So did Lenin, so did the Queen, mm -hmm. and her husband, she didn't like him, obviously. <laughs> um, people just didn't like Bush, so they got rid of him as well. Mm -hmm. um, right, so, what can we protect and what we can't protect? So, anyone tell me if this is a moissanite or a diamond? Anyone? Moist night's a fake diamond. No? Right, you can't tell that from an image. You can tell it in real life. You can't light into it. You get a bright rainbow effect. It's a moist night. You get a white one. It's a diamond. You can't tell that from a photo. Right, this one, uh, it's a horrible car crash. Yeah, someone died, there's police, there's fire, there's even a helicopter turned up. Um, everything's real, apart from the whole scene. It's all been faked for uh, some prom thing, playing out for driving and stuff like that. So you can't tell the intent of what's in the photo. So although the helicopter may be real, you can't tell if it's there for a real reason. So, what can we get? So we can get a bunch of stuff that's embedded into the photo. Exit data, camera data, etc. And there's also a lot of stuff inside a photo that you don't know about, but you can also get, which I'll show you about. So, a quick lesson in how JPEG works. This is some really, really boring max bit. It's only about six or so slides, so generally. You don't have to understand it all day. Right. So, to make a JPEG, what we do is you break down an image into 8 by 8 pixel blocks yeah, for each of the three channels. Simple. Yeah. And then do some complicated math stuff. <laughs> stuff. Right. Um, which breaks us down into a bunch of numbers. 8 by 8. Simple. Right. You do this for each of the layers, by the way. Yeah. You then do some more maths. Get another matrix up. Do some more maths. Get another matrix up. See, I bet you're covering all this one. <laughs> right, so you end up with this. Now, what you end up is this table is made from maths, and this bit is provided by the software manufacturer. So, Adobe or Apple or Nikon or whoever, they set these numbers. This one happens to be set by the Joker standard. Yeah, so once you've done that bit of maths, you end up with this, you strip out all the zeros, you saw it, you've got your compressed image. The decoding is basically reverse of that. Simple, really. Right, so the point of all of that maths yeah, is the quantization table fingerprinting. Yeah, that sounds quite a mouthful, but it's quite easy to understand. Yeah, so this is how a JPEG is made. Yeah. So this bit's all maths, and there's an input from the manufacturer. Now what I found was um, you can you can look at the quantization map that they give, and you can work out the photo has been done by that piece of software. So um, if you if you get a JPEG image and you extract this map, you can tell what software made it. Yeah? This is inherent in the photo, and if you change this, you can't decode the image anymore. Yeah? So, if someone, say, fakes an image, they change the exit data to say, oh, it was done with a Canon. If this is not a Canon matrix, a Canon didn't make that picture. Photoshop did, or whatever the matrix says uh, made it. Yeah? So, if I made a piece of software up, CLI track. It does a whole bunch of other stuff on this bit. Yeah. Um, it's written in 
not in Python, it's written by me, I'm not a programmer, it's written for the command line, ish. Um, and there's loads of other cool stuff which you'll see over the course. Right, so, I'll show you a video if I can get this to work. Some more data goodies for you. Right, this is a photo that I've taken from a much live photo and I've cropped it down. Yeah. Now, some of you from last year might recognise this. Um, okay, so from this photo that we've got, yeah, um, we can't tell what else is outside of these frames. Yeah? It's lost forever. Yeah? Never be able to work it out. Except we can. Right, inside JPEG headers, or format rather, um, there's some nice little hex bits that tell it where the start of the image is. Yeah? And sometimes, if you're really lucky, you'll find another one. Yeah? So instead of extracting this image as when you load it up in Photoshop or your image, here, if you tell it to open up this one, you'll get this. Like, it's mostly low res, but that's the bit that you could see in the photo. This is all the extra data that you've now got. So if you've got someone online that's chopped their head off in the photo, <coughs> have a look for the other image. Because this one's there. It's probably there. It's always quite handy. <laughs> right, so, ah, yeah, this one's a cool one. The CSI effect. You've all watched CSI, yeah? Yeah. And how shit it's science is. <laughs> right, so you've seen this before. Where they go, oh, the macros, oh, they enhance the number plate, and they zoom in at their crappy CCD footage, and it goes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Here, the point of this desk in 
this photo at the same point, you can work out. And the more photos you have, the better you can be of them. I'm going to cut another video now of me experimenting with this. Uh, so this is some pictures I took of uh, nest tables in my house. And hopefully, in a second. Okay. And it builds a 3D model for you. From just basically, it's, it's about six or seven photos. And it does this automatically for you. It's kind of cool. It's not in CLI track at the moment, but I'm hoping it will be. So, and there are some very, very cool people out there that have a lot better at them than this. So I hope next year I'll be a bit more. Right, anyone know what chromatic aberration is from last year? Yes? Yeah. How many people died from this? Yes. How
great book, a spherical map of the Earth and out rather than this. I'll draw that up. Right, I really do know where she lives. See? Hot plants, steps. It's very cool. It's a little street. I also know a lot more about that, but I'm not going to get into that. Right, so I'm going to show you a couple of other things that CLI track can do as well. Sorry if this is going a little bit quick, but we are. So there's a couple of other cool little things that I'm able to do for you. And I'll put this in the all sorts of wrong area forward as well. Um, right. I thought it would be really handy if you could work out if an image you, you've got in your direct view of images or the cloud or whatever um, contains flesh. Because they're the ones that people are interested in, right? <laughs> <laughs> Holiday snaps and stuff. <laughs> um, so CLR Track has this flesh finding function.
kind of do a fuzzy search over an image and work out if any of those match in the image. Um, and it, you can use it for any object. So you just put in a bunch of photos of the object you want, and it will search through the images and find them all. Hopefully that will get um, in the CLI track at some point as well. Um, right, so, um, ah, right, we'll go back to Hammond. Um, you'll notice that when I said I knew where Hammond lived, um, I think it was in this video. Okay, right, so I run CLI track with a um, a G flag to extract all the GPS location stuff. Yeah. And what this does is it gives you a link for everything and you can go through the web browser, etc. I think I can show you that. Okay, that's an image taken in London and Google Maps will show us it's in London. Uh, London uh, uh, no, Parliament or whatever it is. So it's, it's roughly in the right direction. Uh, this is some guy's map. He took a picture of his brand new map. Where does he live? Back house. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, oh, this girl took a picture of herself in the bathroom in the bikini. Awesome. Where does she live? There. <laughs> <laughs> right. So the trouble with this is, is if you had like hundreds of these pictures, working out, you know, what the best neighbourhood is to go to to find all these people. Or what, whose house is breaking, steal the new mapping lockers and whatnot. Um, it's a bit hard doing this one, one at a time. So I wrote this cool extra speech here, which I'll show you hopefully in a second. Right, dash D, which will do the same thing, but it'll make this little plot file for you yeah, at the end. So when you open it up, and see when I open it up, opens up Google Earth, plots all the photos on Google Earth. <laughs> yeah. So there's the one in London. Now oh, that's where Hannah lives. Uh, that's the girl in the bikini. So now we're getting a more spatial awareness of where all these things are. So I want to go in <laughs> see where Hannah lives. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's Ultra Street. That's good. So we know she's there. Ah, that's where she lives. It's much easier to get a sense of where people are. <laughs> <laughs> right. So. Um, Okay, let's do the final bit now. Yeah, I'm running out of time. Um, how many people here know Adam Savage from Mythbusters? Yeah. How many people know where he lives? Right, Adam Savage is one of these people that likes to tweet or tweet pictures. Um, and it's really handy. Because they like to do it a lot. So you can, uh, oh, sorry, I'm just going um, Yeah, Adam's got quite a few pictures, which we'll see in a second. You'll notice it's actually quite a quick to do this as well. That's several hundred pictures that it just went through in about a second. So when I open up the plot file this time, there are all of these images from Twitter that I just stole. I mean, downloaded. Um, when it gets plotted onto Google Earth, you can see where Adam likes to hang out. <laughs> so there's three major locations that you take pictures of. <coughs> this one I'll, I'll save you the trouble about to see his holiday. Um, this, which you'll see in a second, is him on set for Mythbusters doing something about a plane. So, um, as everyone knows, Mythbusters is filmed in San Francisco, so we'll go in there. Right, so it's looking quite close as to where maybe he takes a lot of photos. So up there, well, there will seem to be a him at work. Quite handy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember that so yeah. Right, so there are all the pictures from work. That's him hanging out with his mate. Another mate. Oh, that's him on the way to work. Wait a second. On the way to work. If that's work and he's on his way to work, what's this cluster then? <laughs> Probably lives there, I reckon. <laughs> oh, one thing I actually missed on this. This one here, that's where he takes his dog for a walk every day. <laughs> Just in case you want to accost him. Um, so, we'll move into this last little cluster. 
Thích lực đó, hay là gọi là danh nghĩ sao? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, so we're trying to get him an idea now of where he is, roughly in the area. Now you can tell that his phone's not been using um, GPS for location, it's been using the GPRS mobile signal, which is what it does when it can't find the GPS signal. Um, so you'll notice some of them are a little bit anomalous. So if you had only one photo, you might think, well, maybe he lives up here. So this is where the power of the plotting comes in, because you can say, well, they're mostly clustered around here. Yeah. So if you were to look through these photos, we'll get an idea of, right, this is quite a good one, because I remember this tweet. He said it, he took this of his new Jeep coming out of his house. So it would be really handy if we could find the house opposite his. <laughs> so you can't really tell that. <laughs> That's slight, slightly like a light blue, and this has like some strange thing on top. So if we could find those somewhere in San Francisco, it'd be fairly easy to find where it is, I reckon. So thank you, use the power of plotting. I'll take rid of this. Yeah. Um, right, so we'll start on this road. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, that, that's it. You can, you can just tell where people live. It's a bit crazy. So be careful about loading your photos. Just like, just I don't know. Right, I think we're done. So I think we're done. Okay, that's it.